Hey everybody, it's great to be here. Um, I'm gonna stick that slide up. I um, I am, here's the deal with snakes. If you like snakes, you wanna know more about them. And if you dislike snakes, you wanna know more about them. And the thing that people always want to know the most about is they wanna know about venomous snakes. And they want to know, what do I do if I ever get bit by a snake? So I'm going to get that over with right off the bat. And it's an odd way to deliver a pro snake talk, but it's still, it's an important part of the discussion because there's a lot of myths about this stuff. And I want to straighten some of this out. These notes I'm using right now were written actually for a hiking group. So some of this stuff might be a little stretch for us, but I, I kept all the points in. And the first thing, so bear with me a bit, because it's not my, this might not sound like you or activities you might pursue, but if you are outside and you know you've been bit by a snake, now many of you perhaps are gardeners, so you might not be on a remote trail somewhere. And I know this sounds funny, but the first and best thing you can do is remain calm because when people realize that they were bit by apparently what was a venomous snake just because they know or they see the snake. What they tend to do is go nuts, turn around, run, maybe run off a cliff, literally, or run into a tree. So if you can just say, this is gonna be a really bad day and try to get about 20 to 30 feet away from the snake and have a seat. And if you can take off all your jewelry uh, on fingers, bracelets, things like that, anything tight that you have on you. Um, there is absolutely, it is a total myth to take out your little pocket knife and draw little lectures and cut yourself and try to draw out the venom. If you think about it, snakes deliver venom through their hollow fangs and their fangs are curved. And even a relatively small venomous snake um, is probably gonna have quarter inch fangs and they don't deliver it in a snake in a straight shot they kind of go in at a curve so you don't really have direct access to the venom anyway and you're never going to be able to suck it out it's it's too deep so that's not true and i usually check once a year just for the heck of it and i did before this talk and i went online and i looked up snake bite kits and they exist even though they don't work and you can get them anywhere from $6.95 to I found one for as much as $85. And if you happen to have one, you can throw it out. Um, don't ever use a tourniquet because what happens is you're gonna have venom, 85% of bites happen from the knee down and you're gonna have the venom. If you take a tourniquet, so let's say you have a belt on and you're like, okay, I'm gonna make a tourniquet and you put it just below your knee. You're gonna concentrate all the venom in that area on your body and that is not in your best interest. Don't use tourniquets, just let the venom literally make its way through your body and therefore become a little more diluted and not concentrated in any limb. Um, do not take pain relievers like NSAIDs, um, aspirin, ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve because they can react with the venom and they won't allow your blood to clot. So, you never want to use ice because ice will slow down the blood flow and it won't be as dramatic as a tourniquet, but it will make your blood uh, move through your body a little bit slower and kind of concentrate the venom in that one area. Um, don't capture the snake. You don't need to take a picture of the snake. Now here I'm speaking about relatively locally. That would be because I believe many of the people that are listening will be from Northeast Tennessee, North Carolina, South East Kentucky and Southwest Virginia. We only have two venomous species. They're both pit vipers and you don't, and, and antivenom will work for both of them. So you don't need, if you were bit by a venomous snake, don't worry about it. You go and you tell the hospital, I need antivenom. They don't have to know like, well, what kind of snake bit you? It won't matter. If you travel and you're in Costa Rica or Australia or out West, it's a whole nother story but I just thought I'd throw that out. Um, if you think of it, take out a pen out of your backpack or whatever, draw a circle around the area, write the time down about every 30 minutes, draw another circle to the extent of the swelling, you're going to swell. 
um, that'll really help them treat you when they see that recorded effort that you've made. It'll just really help you out. Try to take five minutes and reinvent calm. Now, if you happen to be a hiker and you're on the trail, here's something most people don't realize. Let's say I'm hiking by myself. Let's say I don't have coverage. Um, the best thing that I can do is say, okay, so a mile back, there was an intersection that's pretty heavily traveled by other hikers. Walk back to that intersection. It is better for you to walk towards help than to sit and wait and not let the blood circulate. All right. And, and you've got a six hour window of time. You're going to be okay. Incidences of death from snake bite in our area are almost non-existent. It's an over-exaggerated situation. It's not gonna be fun. I understand snake bites are extremely painful, but if you receive treatment, you will be, most likely you will be fine unless you have some, some other physical issues. So let's see, what else do we have? Um, that's pretty much it. So that's an odd way to start out a talk, like I've said before. And at this point, I wanna mention, there's a really good, I'm really picky about the Facebook groups that I'm a member of, but one of them is National Snake Bite Support and they have excellent information. And I believe though I'm not positive that I had to ask to become a member and who it's headed by are the envenomation specialists in the country. I think it's based out of Texas and these guys know what to do in the event of a snake bite. So people can write in, and then if somebody writes in, very often the bites reference a pet. Sometimes it's a person though. And once somebody writes in, nobody else that's a member of this group can make a comment. And if you make a comment, they'll throw you off and they'll never let you back on. The conversation is now between the person, the patient, and the doctor. And they will tell you how to advocate for yourself. They also put up continuously, this is what you need to do for yourself while the ambulance is on the way, pre-hospital stuff. And they will tell you what to do, how to advocate for yourself while you're in the hospital. You guys, we'll talk about the rarity of snake bite in a minute. It's really, really rare. So if you do get bit, you really would need to advocate for yourself because doctors never treat it. So a lot of times doctors will try to give you steroids or they'll give you antibiotics and they will have no effect on your condition or they'll do the, well, we're just gonna wait and see. You need antivenom. Antivenom is the only thing that's gonna work on snake venom. And that will be the thing that will prevent the tissue damage. Because if you don't treat yourself, you're gonna be miserable for quite a few days versus a much shorter period of time. And, and you might lose the feeling that you have on your left foot for the rest of your life. So get treatment. All right. So once again, that was National Snake Bite Support Facebook group. There's another Facebook group that I like. It's called Wild Snakes Education and Discussion. It's a well-run site. You can, because if you don't know a lot about snakes and you find a snake in your yard, well, you can always send me a picture, but you can send it to them. You have to say where, where the, like, uh, the town and the county and the state or the town and the state. And can you help me identify this, please? And these guys know their stuff. The thing that I'm not crazy about about the site is it's um, it's a worldwide site. So I love to learn about native species and I don't have as much interest in uh, boa constrictors and anacondas and taipans and things like that because I don't live in South America or Africa, I live here. But it's still pretty interesting. And they're a great source of consistent information and articles if you find that you want to learn more about snakes so alrighty then now i need you to listen to me and this is going to be weird because i'm going to talk fast and i'm going to tell you how to tell the difference between a venomous snake and a non-venomous snake all right and then i'm going to fix it you'll see what i mean in a minute so i'm going to go to the next slide all right a non-venomous snake in our area has a pupil that is round, not a pupil that is slit like a cat's eye in bright sunlight, okay? Their head is much more streamlined and pretty much goes directly into the width of their body. On the belly, all snakes have what's called the vent. That's where they mate, that's where they lay eggs. 
That's where they go to the bathroom. And in a non-venomous snake, just below the vent, you will have two scales from below the vent to the tail tip. Whereas in a venomous snake, you will have one scale, the full length of the body. A venomous snake has a triangular shaped head. A venomous snake has slit pupils. And we have a couple species of snakes here. Actually, if we were in South Carolina, we would, but I wanna give you another example of how people tell the difference between venomous snakes and non-venomous snakes. There's one snake called the coral snake. Don't have it here but it's in South Carolina. It is a snake that has black, red, and yellow. There are some non-venomous species of um, red, black, and yellow snakes, like the scarlet snake or the car scarlet king snake. So here's some handy palms for you to remember. If the colors are aligned such that red touches yellow, that'll kill a fellow. That's the bad guy, so they say. There are no bad snakes. That's the coral snake. Red touch black, venom black. Yellow touches red, soon you'll be dead. Red touches black, friend is Jack. Okay, so now with that in mind, I'm gonna show you a couple of slides and you tell me who the good guy is. <laughs> oh, you don't know? <laughs> all right, here's the deal with all that. Please never consider any of those ways to tell a venomous snake from a non-venomous snake. People teach that every day and it's nuts. It's nuts. How close to a snake do you have to be to see their pupil? Okay. And I got news for you. In dull light, snakes pupils do exactly what ours do. It will enlarge and it will become round just like your cat. In bright sunlight, they have a slip pupil. When it's pretty dark out, they've got, sorry, my cat's bugging me. They've got around people. All right, triangular head. I'm sorry, that's much too subjective for me. If I'm in the woods and I see a snake, I'm like, I don't know, is that a triangular head? What do you think? What do you think? What if I'm wrong? And I try to catch it and I, and I mess up. Um, besides, mimicry in nature is utilized all the time. Viceroy butterflies look like monarch butterflies and they benefit from that because species of birds know and many other animals that that is a toxic insect to eat. And even though viceroys aren't toxic, they, they benefit from that. So with mimicry and snakes, I've seen garter snakes, I've seen rat snakes, which are both non-venomous, flail their head and make it look like a triangle to freak you out and to convince you that they are venomous, but they're not. So there goes that. And belly scales, that's insane. What are you going to do? Go over a snake, flip it over and expect it to lie there while you're looking at belly scales? That's nuts. And the poem, I mean, come on. You're in the woods and, and you're trying to remember the poem. What if you say it backwards? What if you say it backwards? And oh, by the way, oops, there's your coral snake right there. The other guy is a beautiful scarlet king. So how do I tell the difference between snakes? Um, first of all, we have 23 different species of snakes in Northeast Tennessee, and we only have two venomous snakes. So if you are a person that doesn't like snakes, this won't really matter to you because if you see a snake, you don't want to go near any of them. But if you are a person that is interested by snakes, then I suggest strongly that you take the time to perhaps learn what the two venomous species look like. And I mean, when I grew up, I had such an interest in snakes from when I was a little, little kid. And I remember when I caught my first snake, and I showed it to my dad that night and he said, you know what, you need to learn about snakes because you can get hurt. So I had to attend programs like this and go to the library and get books. And now you can jump online. You can jump online and look at pictures like I'm going to show you every day for five minutes for two weeks at the most. And you will know what a timber rattlesnake looks like or a copperhead. So let's take a peek. All right, this is a juvenile copperhead. And the reason that I know it's juvenile is it's got that fluorescent greenish tail tip. They will have that coloration well into their second year. They use that as, as a caudal learning. They'll hold up their tail and they'll manipulate it and it will look kind of like a worm. And that can entice prey that they eat as young snakes to come closer like a frog or a toad. And then of course they'll snatch up the animal. When I was a little kid and I heard about copperheads, I always thought copperheads had a really orange head. They don't. It's really a slightly different color brown. 
they're actually a really pretty snake. This may help you and this may not, but many people, when you look at the pattern, if you look at the dark brown, the shape and the color is somewhat, well, can remind you of a Hershey's chocolate kiss. So, and that helps a lot of people figure out the copperhead pattern, but you've got to remember, because you know this, you know this from being nature people, there's always exceptions in nature. Sometimes every once in a while, very rarely, it's like having a piebald deer or an albino, whatever. Every once in a while, you will find a copperhead that doesn't have a pattern. But 99.9% .9 of the time, copperheads are pretty much gonna look like this. Let's take a peek at a larger copperhead. Alrighty, there he is. And you can kind of see those Hershey Kiss darker brown um, patterns. The saddle or the wider part is down low on this snake versus up top. Okay, you can see that they have heavily keeled scales. So the, the scale itself comes to a little point, a little ridge. And um, both of our non, excuse me, both of our venomous snakes have keeled scales. And then there's this guy. And I put this slide in here. It was taken with a special camera, but I want you to look at his pupil. That is a copperhead and he has a round pupil. So there goes that whole pupil thing. Okay. All right, let's take a peek at the other guy. This is a timber rattlesnake. Now, I hate to say this, but some snakes, not many, come in different color phases. And this is one of them, but the pattern is always the same. So this is a brown timber. And he's got what they call a chevron pattern with his dark spots, kind of an arrow that points towards his head, if you will, a big wide arrow. The pattern's always gonna be the same. So let's take a look at this guy. Now, unfortunately you're like, but I can't see the pattern. You can if you look, but you're right. If you saw this snake in the woods, you'd be like, well, that's a big black snake. Um, rattlesnakes tend to be very thick body. They look very different to me, at least to me and to most people, even people that don't look no snakes. They are very fat, if you will, and and they're a lot. So they're a lot thicker than our other three species of black snakes. And then finally, we have a yellow phase um, snake. This is the type that we have on Buffalo Mountain. I took this picture when I was up there. Really, really pretty snake. So you got your light brown, you got your black, you got your yellow. Let me see what's next. Aha, bunch of kids. All right. So when I was a little kid and I caught my first snake, I lived in Massachusetts. And in Massachusetts, there were 14 different kinds of snakes. And nobody really told me, or I couldn't relate to the whole eye head shape thing. I wanted something more specific. And I always wondered as a little kid, why don't people just do it by pattern and color? It's so much easier. If I see a snake from 20 feet, I mean, and, and it's striped from head to tail, with yellow stripes and it's got dark, dark green or black in between, that's gotta be either a garter snake or, or a ribbon snake. That's what it's gotta be. So I know from a good distance what the snake is based on color and pattern. And I'm gonna tell you this, and this is true. I do summer nature camps in the summer. One of my favorite weeks is reptile and amphibian week. And um, I have a lot of time to fill and I make it count. And I did this, goofy game and I do it all the time. They love it. The kids love it. I have about 30 kids per camp. I will take a picture of all 23 snakes, like an eight and a half by 11. I have them laminated. They're all sitting there. I'm doing a snake yap. And I go, all right, now we're going to learn these snakes. And I go through and I might tell a little story about each snake. Um, and I hold it up. I mean, for like a minute or two. And I'll say, this is a black rat snake. This is a timber rattler. This is a rough green snake. And then I go through them again and I hold them up like flashcards and I go, what's this one? And they know it. And after the second time through, they really know it. And then I go up and I have vitamin two teams and they pick a great name for their teams and they compete against each other. And it's just a homemade game. I will take those laminated sheets of paper and I will put them down and separate them by about three feet. And they're all in a single line. And I've got the kids at 30 feet away in two lines. And then I tell them the rules and I will call out a snake's name and say, go. 
and a member from each team has to run up, run up and down that line and put their foot on the snake whose name I've called. And whatever team, whatever kid from their team puts their foot on that snake first, their team gets point. And it's a competitive game and they love it. So it reinforces what they've learned. They are good at it. So if these kids can learn it, it's learnable. Don't sit there and think, I can't do it. Snakes are so much easier than birds. Oh my gosh, I'm such a bad bird. Birds are like, you got your boy birds, you got your girl girl birds, you got your juveniles, you got your migratories, you got your weirdo birds. I mean, forget it. So anyway, um, now I'd like to show you a couple of slides of some of the most common snakes that I catch, that I that I see and that I catch. I keep track of all the snakes I catch every year. It's just something I've done my whole life and I, I'm sure I always will. I do not catch venomous snakes. I have no reason to catch venomous snakes. The stakes are way too high. I think those people are nuts. If you're a research person, that's a different story, but there's very few people that need to be catching venomous snakes. Um, so I think last year was a really good year. The summer after fourth grade was the year that I caught the most snakes I've ever caught in my life. I caught 36. That was the summer it all started for me. Last year, I caught 26. This past year, I caught 17. And I'm going to show you these guys because you're, because they're very, they're very um, common. This is an Eastern rat snake. All righty. He's our largest non-venomous species. He's, um, when I lived in Rhode Island, we had him up there and that was the longest snake I ever caught was a seven and a half foot black rat snake. That was a big snake. Um, all right. Now I know this is going to confuse you. But if I see a skinny black snake, I know it's not a rattlesnake because I've studied snakes. I'm not expecting you to know this. And I know therefore it's not a venomous snake and I'm gonna to try to catch it. So there's your Eastern rat, tons of them. I catch, last year I caught 17 snakes. I bet you eight of them were Eastern rat snakes. This is a black racer. When you start studying, as when you start studying anything, you'll see the difference between the two species. And then finally, we have the king snake. He's got white on his sides. Um, those guys are all relatively common. This is a baby black rat snake. I do breed snakes occasionally, or I rescue clutches that people find in their mulch. And they're like, I'm just going to destroy them if you don't come get them. And so I'll hatch them out and release them. Now, what's interesting here is, oops, rat snakes and racers and very few other species, when they're young, they really don't look like what they look like when they're older. Other than this, I promise snakes are very straightforward. Most snakes, when they're born, some snakes have live birth. Some snakes, two thirds of our snakes in our, our area hatch from eggs and they almost always look like a miniature of what they're going to look like as an adult. But rat snakes and racers look, actually they look quite similar as juveniles and then they will lose that pattern as they mature. So that's a young hatchling. He's probably just a couple days old. And then the other snake I catch a boatload of, this is not a double headed snake. This is two garter snakes. Actually, this is kind of interesting. The way that the time during the year when I catch the most snakes is late March into the middle of April. And, um, and that's because it's breeding time and everybody wants to have a date and female snakes leave a pheromone trail. So I was, I was actually on a date and I was walking through the park with this guy and I saw a snake go right across the trail. And then I saw three other snakes go boom, 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 right across the trail. And they were following the scent trail. And I knew it was a female in the front and three males behind. And I managed to catch two of them. And I was really excited and I turned around and he was not happy. And I never saw that guy again. And that's probably a good thing. But anyway, all right, what else do we have? All right, here is another picture of a garter snake. And he is dark in between yellow stripes from head to tail. And then I'm gonna leave this picture up for a minute. And now I'm gonna to get to kind of the meaty bits. And I, I have said my whole life, um, 
find something else to worry about. The incidents of snake bite are very rare, especially when you compare it to other things like falling down the stairs or getting bit by a dog or kicked by a horse. I mean, trust me, you have to find something else to worry about. But then I wondered, is it possible for me to be able to collect the facts? Like the facts, somebody has to know how many times we use antivenom in this area. And I found that person and she was awesome. And she gave me information and she gave me the last two years, she gave me actually, um, it was 21 and 22. And I have all the data on all the snake bites. And that's what I wanna talk about now. So she gave me the sex of the person that was bit, the age of the person that was bit, where the person lived, what part of the body the person was bit on, and what they were doing at that time. And I can read them all to you, but I'm not gonna read them all to you. I'm gonna kind of summarize. It was really interesting. She gave me data from all of the 29 counties that Ballard Health is over, and that includes 20 hospitals. So that includes the geographical areas that I mentioned previously, parts of Kentucky, Southwest Virginia, Northwest North Carolina, and uh, Northeast Tennessee. And there were, in that two year period, I remember one of those years, really pretty much both of those years were considered pandemic years. So people were outside a lot more. And we live in a really agricultural and recreational area. There were 17 bites total, 17 bites out of millions and millions of people. So here is, uh, these numbers are based on Crofab, which is the name of the anti-venom that's used. And I'm sure there were probably, just being honest, a couple of other bites which never made it to the hospital because some people are just like that. Like, well, I'll be fine, I'll just tough it out. But um, as far as anti-venom use goes, 17 bites. So here we go. We had two people that were bit in chicken coops. We had one person that was bit while feeding his dogs in the barn. We had one kid uh, who was playing with another bunch of kids and, and he was, got a bite. One child was bit while playing hide and seek with grandma, poor grandma. One person got bit while dismantling a concrete wall and rebuilding it. One person stepped on a snake while on the porch. One person stepped on a snake while walking in their yard. One person, one person got bit because a snake somehow ended up in her laundry basket in her basement. Not a good day. One person stepped on a snake when they went back outside at night to turn off some lights. One person was bit when they kind of unwrapped a canvas top to their boat and a snake actually fell on them. And in the scuffle, that person was bit. One person was bit while hiking. And here we go. And remember, I could lie to you because you don't know the data, but I do. And I'm not going to lie. Five people were bit while working in their yard. And that's probably a lot of us. All right. So I want to put this into perspective. Um, you know, snakes want what everybody else wants. Snakes want food, cover, water, shelter. And if we are here because we have an interest in wild ones and we believe in fixing our landscape and using native plants, we're going to provide, we're going to provide wildlife habitat for many different animals. So we're going to attract snakes. And if you are uncomfortable with that, then you have to pay the price, you have to make a choice. Um, then keep mowing your lawn and don't have any cool plants in your yard and have everything like two inches tall because that's not gonna afford, afford it really any wildlife, any food cover or shelter. So I want you to understand. So if I go back and I look at those examples, let's start there. Um, Okay, two people were bit while in a chicken coop. Well, I got news for you. Between eggs, baby chickens, and chicken feed, which probably attracts mice and rats, that is a snake restaurant. And you can make your chicken coop snake proof. So I can't blame the snake in those situations. Somebody was bit while feeding dogs in a barn. Um, 
I bet he fed them there every day. And I bet the mice and rats came and got all the little tiny bits that the dogs left behind. And that also turned into perhaps a snake restaurant and attracted snakes. Um, so perhaps his feeding needs to be done elsewhere or change it up or be more careful or more vigilant. Little kids playing, that makes me wonder, did those little kids ever get the snake talk that most little kids get? Like, hey, because little kids are gonna pick up anything. So you do have to tell your child, especially if your kid spends a lot of time outside, you know, if you see a snake, you need to tell a big person. And when you're a bigger kid, you can learn about snakes. And yes, there are some snakes that you can pick up, but that'll happen when you're a bigger child. So right now, if you see a snake, don't ever, did that? Did, did those parents ever deliver that message? I don't know, I wasn't there. Playing hide and seek with grandma, you know they were running like crazy and it was all about hiding and nobody was paying attention and we know how that happened. Dismantling a concrete wall, you're sticking your little hands, I bet you was cavity block into all those little I don't know, broken up bricks and stones and pulling them down. I can definitely see that happening. Stepped on while on porch. Obviously the person didn't see the snake or they never would have stepped on it. So the only thing that the snake can do in that case is turn around and say, hey, I'm down here and I don't want to die today. And the only thing I can do to you is bite you. So I'm going to do that. Um, walking in the yard, same thing. Laundry basket, no idea. Uh, no idea, probably an older home. Uh, the snake got into the building and maybe she, I don't know, laundry basket, pretty good place to hide if you're a snake. I think that was just an unfortunate circumstance. Going outside at night to turn off lights, you probably need to put on shoes, if, especially if you live in an area where you think there are venomous snakes. Hiking wasn't there. Don't know what happened. Did the hiker step on the log and look before he stepped or did he just step over the log and place his foot on a snake? I don't know. So when you're outside in woods, you have to be, um, gotta, gotta keep your eyes peeled. And that brings us to people working in the yard. You know, a lot of times we're so familiar with our yards that we're just not as vigilant as we need to be. So, I suggest the best way to coexist with snakes is to educate yourself. You need to start paying attention. Um, you know, you can, you can have conversations with yourself like, you know, last year, I remember when I took the tarp off the pool and there were a couple snakes under there. And so expect them this year or don't leave your garage door open so that a snake can crawl in there and, uh, find a place to escape, close your garage doors, put your log piles up, don't leave them on the ground. Um, there's just, just use common sense before you drop on your knees to start picking weeds. And if you're in an area which looks like it could be good snake habitat, then I would take a big rake or something long handled and kind of move it through that area back and forth, back and forth, back and forth before I ever got down there and started weeding. I know you know what poison ivy looks like. And because you know what poison ivy looks like, you don't get poison ivy because you've educated yourself. It's the same thing with yellow jackets. I hike all the time. And in the fall, when their food decreases, I, oh, so many yellow jacket nests on the trail. So I'm always looking. I see a ripped apart log that a skunk or a bear had at because there were yellow jackets in there. I'm paying attention as I walk by that log. Maybe I'm giving it a, a little bit more space. I'm always looking for holes in the ground. So I've educated myself. It's the same thing with snakes. Expect them. If you're making your yard into an awesome habitat, then expect to see snakes and every other thing that you hope to attract. Um, what else? What else? Let me think. Let me think. Um, I, I think, and I want to go through a few slides here, um, and see if there's any questions, but it's, it's fairly obvious to really anybody, especially these days that, that we can no longer decide to keep hating certain animals. And we've done that for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years. We don't like snakes, so we kill them. We don't like sharks, so we kill them. We don't like spiders, so we kill them. We don't like bats, so we kill them. And you guys, 
you more than a lot of people know it's all connected. I would, I cannot imagine the mice and rat situation if we didn't have snakes and talk about human diseases that mice and rats can give you an economic um, financial ruin for mice and rats. It would be a very, very different place. So, you know, the value of wildlife isn't, it isn't based on what you or I think of it. It's, if it's here, it's here for a reason. So I don't know if there's any questions or if, tell you what, let me zip through, and, and this, I'm not gonna quiz you, I promise. I'm gonna zip through these because some of you might recognize a snake that you've seen, and if not, I can always go back and discuss a specific snake. This is a Northern water snake, they're very common. By the way, we do not have water moccasins, also known as cottonmouths, in Northeast Tennessee or in the geographical areas that I mentioned. Um, they are in the state. Here we have two venomous species, as you are aware. In the whole state of Tennessee, we have four total. When you get well west of Nashville, you can then add the water moccasin and the pygmy rattlesnake. These guys, get confused for water moccasins all the time and people chop them in half all the time. This is a beautiful little ring neck snake. Uh, they're pretty nocturnal. They come, they have a ring around their neck and it's either yellow, if it's yellow, they're gonna have a yellow belly. If it's orange, they're gonna have an orange belly. I caught this snake and it's the smallest snake I have ever caught. It was so cool. All right, this is a milk snake. And if, you know, sometimes give yourself some leeway if you go, oh my gosh, it's a snake, it has a pattern, it has brown on it, then always be careful. If you don't know if that looks vaguely like a copperhead to you, then just leave it alone, just leave it alone. But you certainly don't have to kill it. This is a queen snake. They are very food specific, they eat crayfish and only when the crayfish has molted its skin, its shell, which is a pretty, I can't imagine how these guys find soft-bodied crayfish to eat, but they do. They're pretty cool. They live in wetland areas. This is a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful rough green snake. I caught one for the first time in about six years last year. Excuse me. Yeah, rough green snake. Beautiful snake. There's only one snake in our area that looks like that. It is a non-venomous rough green snake. This guy's a ribbon snake. I told you he looks a heck of a lot like a garter. And there's your proof. This is a brown decay snake, sometimes called brown snake and sometimes called a decay snake. Very common little guy, probably maxes out at about 18 inches. Um, this is a corn snake, one of our prettiest snakes. I have yet to catch one since I've moved to Tennessee. Oh, this is snake boy. And I have had Snake Boy and Snake Girl, my daughter named them. She was really little. I wanted to learn, I wanted to see if I could breed snakes and raise a clutch. And so I got a male and female corn snake. And I have had, I still have, okay, so this is Snake Boy on his 20th birthday. And we had a big party for him and I had a cake. And um, he died one month shy of turning 21. Snake Girl, on the other hand, who I think you might meet in a minute, is going to turn 23 next year. So um, they can live for a long, long time. He was a great snake. Oh, there's Snake Boy. Yep, Easter Sunday, wouldn't you know it. This is a hognose snake. He has a turned up nose, kind of like a pig. He's also food specific. He likes to eat toads and that helps him kind of dig up, if you will, the loose dirt that a toad might use to burrow himself in. Here is a hog snake and he will flatten his neck. His nickname is Puff Adder and he does a crazy thing. He will try to freak you out with that. And if you still try to mess with him, let's say you're a fox or a possum and you're trying to eat him, then he will roll over and play dead. And it's amazing his acting ability. And animals have learned um, on a level that we don't understand that, hmm, I don't know. I know that thing was alive a second ago, but right now it's looking and smelling really, really, really dead. And I could get very hurt if I eat it. So I'm going to leave it alone. And the snake will, has the potential to live to see another day. 
This is a worm snake, little beanie guys live in, you might see some of these guys in your garden. They live under um, leaf litter, very small, very secretive, eat a lot of worms. Ah, a beautiful red belly. They come in a gray, they come in a brown and they will flash their underside and a ring neck does the same thing to warn people, <laughs> warn people, warn predators that they are toxic. This is a mole king snake. A pine snake, I would love to catch a pine snake. Smooth earth snake, very small, kind of like the worm snake. Crown snake, very small little guy. He lives in the same habitat as the worm snake and the smooth earth. Here's a scarlet snake. I think we're almost done. Oh, and here we go. Here are, this is what happens all the time. I do snake IDs all the time on my phone, people send me pictures on Facebook and my work email, my personal email. And I really try to pay attention to them because what will happen is somebody will email me and they'll say, I found a copperhead and they'll send me a picture. And if I don't respond immediately and say, no, it's a milk snake, it's harmless. They will chop it in half. So, but this is how the world sees snakes. I'm on the left and regular people are on the right. And I got news for you. Every snake is always a copperhead. I just got three nights ago, my good friend was mortified, but she sent me a picture of a juvenile rat snake, which was chopped in half. And she said her neighbor did it because she knew it was a copperhead. It's never a copperhead. In all the pictures I've received over all the years, once it's been a copperhead. Oh, let me address one more thing. How many venomous snakes have I seen? Since I've been here, I don't know how many thousands of miles I've hiked because that's my, um, that's my hobby, hiking and riding my motorcycle. And I'm in the woods a lot and I'm always looking for snakes. I've probably seen, I think, probably about 500 snakes. On the trail hiking, I have seen about eight venomous snakes. Um, there are more copperheads than timber rattlers. I have seen more timbers though than copperheads. All total, I have seen about 20 venomous snakes because I do know where there's a couple of snake dens and sometimes I just want to go looking for them when it's really, when it's the perfect temp and the perfect humidity and I know I'm going to find them. But just hiking randomly and looking for snakes and going about my life and at work and I work outside a lot or working in my yard, I have seen very, very few venomous snakes. There's no statistics on this, but the way I explained it to kids is if I got in my truck, my Toyota Tacoma and drove to the Canadian border, I would probably see 10,000 other Toyota Tacomas. And I might see 50 Teslas because Teslas are real. They exist, but there's less of them. It's the same thing with venomous snakes. So if you see a snake, it's highly unlikely it's a venomous snake. If you don't know, leave it alone. Um, I think I have definitely talked enough, perhaps too much. I'm curious if there's questions. <laughs> Thank you. Well, um, Connie, I'll ask a question. I mean, obviously venom venomous snakes can cause more harm, but if someone tries picking up a non-venomous snake, they still can get bit. And that's still uh, uh, an in, or a bite by uh, uh, an animal. What what is your opinion of being uh, bit by just a, a non venomous snake? That's a great question. Um, certainly, a non venomous snake can bite. As a matter of fact, kids always ask me when I bring my snakes and show them the snake, like, "Well, well, well, can he bite you?" And I'm like, "Well, I'm not trying to sound like a wise guy, but he's got a mouth, so he can bite." But here's the deal. Snake boy was six feet long. The noggin on snake boy is about this big. So his teeth basically are like pointed sandpaper. Non-venomous snakes do not have fangs. Have I been bitten? Absolutely. There are times when I'm out and it's rare because I don't like being bitten by anything, even a mosquito. But every once in a while, I see a snake and I have got to catch it because I haven't caught that species before or whatever. And it's gonna beat me to the stone wall. So I don't have time to pin it and pick it up behind the, the head like I normally would so it wouldn't bite me. And I grab it right in the middle of the body. Guess what? 50% of the time, they don't even bite. 
and 50% of the time they do. And it's like little pinpricks and it's not a big deal. So you would just wash that with soap and water. Okay, uh, Beth has a question um, that she wants snakes in her yard. How can she speed up their arrival? Man, what I used to do when I was a little kid, I would seed the area. I would take pieces of tin and plywood and it depends upon your yard. Of course, you don't want this right next to your front door, but I don't know how much area you have. You can go to the edge of your yard, like edge habitat, where the meadow meets the woods or the grass meets the, the woods and put some stuff down. Like, and then you can flip them on the perfect day, meaning you're not gonna look for a snake today, obviously, but you don't wanna flip them every day because then they're, they're too disturbed and you'll never get a snake under there. I used to wait and it was torturous. I would wait about 10 days before I'd flip it. So you can do that. Don't cut your grass back, pile your wood on the ground, um, have a rock pile on the back, let your dead tree stand. You're never gonna have a better birdhouse than a dead tree. Um, I mean, think about the next time you see a snake, look around at the habitat and see what that habitat has that you might wanna duplicate. They need cover, they're very secretive animals. People are like, how do you find snakes all the time? I find snakes just as often when I'm looking for them as when I'm not. It's really luck. Another question, um, how, you know, you're given the statistics about um, how many uh, individuals were given the anti-venom. Now I assume some of those probably were not for venomous snakes. So what is the um, kind of, times when people are given the antiventum when they didn't need it and what are the effects? I have never heard of an individual being given the antivenom when it wasn't a venomous snake bite. They will know if it's a venomous snake bite. They'll know by the fang marks and they'll know by the swelling and they'll know by how the patient feels. Um, a non-venomous snake bite is gonna be like, ow, wash, band-aid, no big deal. Antivenom is really expensive. Hospitals are mandated to keep it if their hospital is in a vicinity where venomous snakes happen to live. They don't use it often. It only has a two-year um, shelf life, and they have to replace it all the time. So they buy this stuff, and they pretty much have to throw it out. So they hate keeping it, but they have to keep it. So they're careful with it. They don't give it away. They don't give it away. You can't walk in there and go, oh, I think I got bit by a snake. They have to determine if it's highly likely that you got bit by a snake. You really wouldn't be able to mistake being bit by a non-venomous or a venomous snake. Okay. Um, Melanie asked if uh, the Eastern rat snakes are territorial. If, you know, she says, suggests she's seen them in kind of the same area in her uh, yard year after year. Sure. It's like a garden spider. If the getting's good, She's going to make her web every day in the same place, same place, same place. So if a snake has a great place to hide and a good food source and he manages to find water um, and a place to hibernate is, is close by, that snake is going to live there year after year after year. And rat snakes are kind of known for that. But they're not territorial at the same time in reference to each other. A black snake is not going to be like a blah, blah, blah bird and say, get out of here, it's mine. They don't care, you know, the more the merrier. Okay, uh, another uh, question. Their daughter lives in uh, North Carolina and does have uh, venomous snakes and their dog has been bitten in her forested backyard. Um, mm. Any suggestions on advice for her daughter? No, that's really tricky. So other than, and I hate to say this, keeping your dog on a leash or not allowing him in the woods, in the area where a snake would be able to hide versus a moat area, you know, you're always going to have to deal with that possibility. Um, and one thing that I don't suggest is spending a big chunk of change and having some snake guy, wildlife snake guy, come in and remove the snakes from your property. It's a system that doesn't work. It usually, they have found out, is a death sentence for the snake. First of all, the guy's probably going to kill it. And second of all, even if he relocates it 50 miles away, the snakes they have found are they will spend the rest of their lives trying to get back to the area where they're from and then they will 
not pay as much attention to a hibernation site that they should be looking for and they concentrate on trying to get back and they'll die in the process. They'll give up food and everything. Even if he didn't make it back, other snakes are probably going to take his place. If she lives in really good snaky habitat, she's going to have snakes. But once again, it's relatively rare. So it's not like, it's not like her dog, it's, it's unlikely her dog would be bit a second time, but who knows, who knows? So I don't really have great advice there because you can't, unless she, she wants to go in and redo the woods. She doesn't want to do that. Other uh, comment from uh, Sharon. Um, it's her understanding is, that, understanding is that it is illegal to kill snakes in Virginia. Is, that, is there a similar uh, uh, law in uh, Tennessee or Kentucky or North yeah. Carolina? I believe all four states, most states have that as law. You may not kill a snake regardless of species. Okay. Um, Donna Edwards has a question. Uh, she'd like to ask it. And so go ahead, yeah, Donna. I can't, I can't type fast enough. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to find out, Connie, if, you know, you mentioned um, towards the end of your presentation that if you don't know what it is, leave it alone. What if you do know what it is and it is venomous? See, I would be inclined to leave it alone anyway, because they are important parts of the ecosystem. And why would we kill venomous snakes? They, they, they belong here as well. What's your advice on that? Um, you're absolutely right. There are no bad snakes. Look, they had everything on the planet has amazing adaptations to allow it to live to see another day and to be able to find food. Look at these guys. We've adapted to have thumbs. We can do amazing things with these thumbs. Try tying your shoes without them or working a zipper. Um, so we've evolved to have thumbs that that works out well for us. So snakes have evolved to have venom. It's the best way for them to to eat, they have the least, imagine a snake trying to eat a rat without killing it first. It's gonna, the rat's gonna bite the snake's face off and bites the snake's eyeball. So if he can just inject venom and back off. So right, there are no bad snakes. And if we look at people out West, if you lived in Arizona, parts of Arizona, New Mexico, many places out West, your backyard would be a bunch of rocks and a couple of zero scapey plants and you'd have snakes and people live like that all the time and don't freak out because they've paid attention to mm, it's kind of snaky out today, you know, or I better be careful when I clean the bird bath today because we haven't had rain in two and a half weeks and there might be a snake around there because I mean everything's thirsty right now. So people pay attention. So I personally, if I found a venomous snake on my property, I would leave it alone. And by the way, I didn't mention this. Across the country on an annual basis, there's about 8,000 snake bites, which is not a lot of snake bites. And 3,000 of those are considered illegitimate because people were goofing with the snake. You know, the guys that had, so I always pick on men. Sorry, sorry, Dick. <laughs> you know, hey, drinking beer. Hey, hey look, a, a, a timber rattlesnake or whatever. Pick it up, I dare you, I dare you. So those bites are included in that 8,000, but they're really not you know, um, and then there is an average out of the 8,000 bites of five deaths. So considering all the snakes we have and all the space that we share with them, that's just, I mean, literally go find something else to worry about. <laughs> I guess. Okay, we, we do have, you know, just to kind of uh, emphasize how popular this talk, topic is of wanting to know about snakes, um, we have a, a listener from uh, Mississippi area, Louisiana, and she does have cotton heads and uh, or cotton mouth uh, snakes and um, a pond. And, you know, any specific, you know, and I think you've addressed it um, a little bit here and there, but any advice on coexisting with her cotton mouth, mouth uh, snakes? Man, I mean, that's really tough. You live in a big cottonmouth area. And if you have a pond on your property, if you, so you're talking to a person that would think that was awesome. So it's, it's sometimes it's tricky to me to, to think in reverse, but if you wanted to eliminate cottonmouths, 
from your pond, and once again, I don't know the size of your pond and I don't know what it looks like, is you would mow everything eh, 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 right up to the edge. You would take away all the cattails, all the shelter, all the rocks, lose your stone wall, um, get your furniture away from the edge of the pond and make it a wildlife desert. Granted, you would still have a pond. Now, you still may have cotton mouse because they will eat a lot of aquatic stuff. Obviously, they are a water-based snake. So if there's a ton of fish in there, they might hang around for a while. But many of them are going to go elsewhere because they don't have the four things that they want. And really important is shelter and cover for snakes because we always think about what snakes eat. We never think about what eats a snake. Tons of stuff eats snakes. Little beanie snakes. When I met Snake Boy for the first time, he was about the size of a pencil. Anything is gonna eat him when he's that size. A turtle, a bullfrog, another snake, a blue jay, a crow, anything. And bigger snakes, predatory birds, other snakes, um, all kinds of stuff eat snakes. So they, they've gotta have those elements that other wildlife have to have. I don't know if that helps, but. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, she uh, responded that, you know, she wasn't trying to eliminate them, but just coexist coexist with them. And I think you've done a pretty good job of, of saying you can, you can, uh, you know, depending on her situation, possibly come up with a way to um, keep her, well, keep them away from them. And, I mean, so I described it then from the wrong direction. If she's more than willing to coexist with them, that you know what? You can even take notes and kind of keep a file on them. Like, hey, I saw the most cotton mouths all year in the first two weeks of April. So remember that the following April. Or... I see them between these temperatures. That's when they seem to be in bathing in the sun or just take notes and educate yourself about their habits. And when you think you, you guys might cross paths. Okay. Well, um, we're pretty well, um, out of time here, but if any other one last question or comment or, well, well I hope one of the, one of the things Connie is that, you know, when, when, uh, you are a naturalist, and it is just so amazing how you so easily bring in all the other parts of our uh, environment, even though you're talking about snakes. We learned about uh, so many other things tonight, and uh, your examples, just amazing. Of um, And maybe that's uh, uh, partially being able to, to communicate with kids, because you know, we're just old kids out here. Uh, so that's fantastic. The examples that you've developed over the years in your game. Um, and oh, okay. uh, so um, I think, uh, yeah, no more questions. So uh, again, thank you everyone um, thank for you so uh, being part of this. And thank you, Connie, for uh, taking your time to present it. It was fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you, Connie. Thank you. Great talk. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>